Well, I appreciate your presence, and I hope that the Lord will speak to your heart as he has to mine as I've uh, studied. Denise, good to have you back from the far country. (laughs) Uh, So let's go to the Lord this morning. Father, we thank you for your word, that it is sufficient, and all we need to instruct us and to correct us and to set our sights on the things that please you. We thank you for these two precious Bible women that we look to, and we thank you for the message that they have for each of us. And Lord, I pray that our hearts would be open to your instruction, and we could hear your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we started last week about, uh, I mean last time, about Martha and about Mary. We had that familiar passage in Luke, which only Luke tells us about the time they had Jesus at their home for a meal. And they kind of seemed to be a little attitude problem (laughs) in that, because these are sisters, but they are very different. And they have different viewpoints and different attitudes, and that kind of came out. But I hope that you remember one of the things we saw last time was that both of the women served and both of the women listened. So that was a good thing. I don't want to demean one over the other. But to me, this was a beautiful incident to help teach us something about the gifts of the Spirit that he gives to the church for the edification of the church. And that passage is in uh, Romans 12. I put it on your uh, page up at the top. And these are the different gifts that the Spirit of God gives to people. Now, the Spirit of God can give more than one to one person, but every true believer has at least one. Uh, And I've put them on your sheet, and I want us just to think very briefly about them because we see how these sisters fit in this pattern. The first is the gift of the prophet, and that is someone who exposes sin and calls to repentance and warns of judgment. That's, a, that's the strong gift. <laughs> uh, when you've encountered a prophet, you know. Uh, the second is the servant. The King James says ministry, but servant is a um, more useful word maybe in our way of speaking. That's a person who renders practical help so that everybody can function in their jobs. Uh, I'm grateful for the practical help that Mike and Connie give us in the church to clean up after us every week, the practical help that the secretaries do for like mailing out newsletters and sending out messages. Uh, They're just jobs that need to be done so we can keep going. The next one is a teacher. This is somebody who loves Bible study and is intent on telling the precise meanings of words and comparing scripture with scripture and having maps and having visuals. Do you know anybody like this? (laughs) Y'all put up with a lot. (laughs) But I'm encouraged to know that it is God that makes me want to study that way. Uh, And then there's the exhorter. That's the encouragement kind of person. I do a little... Uh, 10 minute walking video for old people to do exercises and the lady that does it is always saying you can do it just three more come on let's get rid of these jiggly arms (laughs) always encouraging and uh, so that's kind of the mission of the exhorter the giver is somebody who gives generously they may or may not be a rich person but they give generously when there's need. And then there's the organizer, people who help us get things together. Like when we have a fellowship meal, we have to have an organizer. Actually, when we pass out the Lord's Supper in these days, we have to organize and do it in a way that is appropriate and safe. Uh, And then the last one is mercy, which is a little harder to know, but this person is very sensitive to the feelings of others. This person probably feels deeply uh, for us, for herself. She sees somebody and she thinks, oh, they're hurting. I'm going to encourage them. I'm going to go out to lunch with them or whatever. 
Uh, and these are wonderful gifts. Now, these are gifts that God has given us for the whole church. Now, the problem with COVID is when we don't get together, it's a lot harder to do the ministry. You have to do something special. To help us understand, let's make one more application. Suppose somebody in church is in the hospital. All right, these people come in. And the prophet, let's say they all came in the room at once. This is pre-COVID. <laughs> and they're all talking to this buddy. Now the prophet will say, what is God showing you through this illness? Are you sure you don't have a sin you haven't confessed? And the servant says, I've been by your house. I brought in your mail, fed your dog, watered your flowers, and found your hidden key and went in and washed your dishes. <laughs> Practical help. The teacher says, I've done some research on your problem. This person fell and broke a hip. And the teacher says, you know, you could have broken your hip and then fell. And you, they're treated different ways. So let's see what, what you need. <laughs> Very precise. The exhorter or the encourager will say, don't be discouraged. You'll be especially able to minister to people who are in the same condition because of what you're going through. The giver will say, do you have medical insurance? Do you know what your copay is? Can you pay the surgeon? The organizer will will be his boss at work who said, don't worry about your job. I divided up what you do and gave it to five other people. <laughs> so it will still happen. And Mercy says, I just cried when I heard what happened to you. How do you feel? Now, that little person is thoroughly ministered to. But the problem sometimes in churches, and ladies, I'll be honest, often in marriages, you have a different motivational gift than other people. And Mercy would say, what on earth does he mean coming in here saying, is there any sin in your life? And the teacher says, good grief, he asked about insurance. <laughs> because we view situations differently. Now, of these gifts, which do we see that Martha was? She was definitely an organizer Maybe a servant. and a servant. She was serving <laughs> in the last lesson. What about Mary? This is a little harder right now, but I think it will become apparent today. I think so. I think she knew that Jesus wanted to share truth with the people that were there, and she put herself in the place to hear that. Uh, well, we're going to look at these two ladies in John 11 today. Uh, if you'll turn there. And I'm going to refrain myself from talking about the resurrection of Lazarus, which is just almost too good to not talk about. <laughs> but I want us to look at uh, this family. If you look at verse 1, it doesn't start with the girls. It starts with their brother. Lazarus, he was of Bethany the town of Mary and her sister, Martha. Interesting order there, isn't it? Lazarus, Mary, Martha. Uh, and then verse 2, he qualifies, it was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair. Now that's going to happen in today's lesson, but has not happened yet. Uh, the Greek that John uses just indicates that the readers knew these people and they were all friends. And he says that they have a problem. And what is it? Lazarus is sick. Oh, I thought people who served God didn't have problems. <laughs> you knew that was a joke. <laughs> uh, do you expect to be sick and die? good because you will unless the Lord comes or maybe an accident small percentage that's why insurances cover accidental death because it doesn't happen that much <laughs> compared to other causes well what do they do in this situation look at verse 3 
They send a message to Jesus. And what was their message? The one you love is sick. Would Jesus know who they were talking about? Mm -hmm. All right. Did they ask any request? Okay. And they said, the one you love, and that Greek word is phileo, the deep friendship love. Uh, What do you think their expectations were when they sent that message? He would come immediately. I agree with you. Or he would at least send the messenger back with a message, I'm on the way. Um, Now, I don't know how they could find Jesus because everybody's looking for Jesus right now and he's not out and open as much as he has been. He may have been at their house before he went where he was. They think that in... This time he was over on this side of the Jordan River uh, and he came from there because it took him two days to travel from where he was to where they were. Well, I appreciate Mary and Martha that they talked to the Lord about their problem. They took the burden off of their shoulders, what shall we do, and put it on Christ's shoulders, which is a good place for it. Uh, I appreciate that they had grace and faith not to tell Jesus what to do, but just to put the problem before him. Uh, But now, John gives us an insight when Jesus got that message. He tells his disciples something that's very helpful for the reader to know. This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified by it. Now, I had never thought until I really studied this, I believe that Jesus may have sent the messenger back to Mary and Martha with that message. This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God. And we have another clue in verse 15. Uh, He said to his disciples, another purpose is that they might believe. So this event is going to help everybody. Uh, And I will show you the clues that make me think Jesus sent that message back to them as we go through the passage. Look at verse 5. We know that Jesus loves Lazarus. What does this verse say? He He loved Martha and Mary. Now, in the English, that sounds very much alike. But in the Greek, it's a different word. It's the agape word. It's that love of God love. That's how Jesus loved this family. They weren't just his friends. They were in the family of God. And he had that deep love for them. Um, So he stays there. And you know from reading the rest of the text that Jesus does not get to to Bethany until... He has been in the grave four days. I want you to think just a minute. How did Mary and Martha feel? I think it would be hard not to feel betrayed. He has never not come through. They sent him a message. Maybe they remembered that there were times when Jesus spoke healing for somebody that he wasn't in the presence of. I don't know. Have you ever prayed about something and it just... And because we go to church, we don't want to think, well, where is God? But you kind of think, what what is happening here? I can't imagine, not only has their brother died, they've got this burden of... What's happening? Everything I believe seems to not be right. Well, look down to verse 19. It says, Many of the Jews came to Martha and to Mary to comfort them uh, from Jerusalem. But look at 20. Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, 
She went to meet him. The busy, busy woman of action. (laughs) Does that surprise you? But Mary stayed home, immersed in grief. The feeling one there. Uh, Well, verse 21, Martha comes to Jesus and look very carefully. What does she say to him? Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, I want us to notice when we get to Mary talking to Jesus, she says exactly the same words. This is one time when I wish I had a video of her face while she was saying it, or heard her tone of voice while she was saying it. It could have been a wonderful confession of her faith. Lord, you are the life giver, and Lazarus could not have died if you had been here. Or it could be a criticism. Lord, you came too late. You didn't fix this. Look at verse 22, which is a strange verse. Martha said, but I know that even now, whatsoever thou shalt ask of God, God will give it to thee. Uh, I think she believed Jesus could do anything at this point, except she doesn't really think he could raise her brother from the dead. Because in a few moments when Jesus says, roll the stone away from the tomb, what does Martha say? He, no, by now, no. <laughs> by now, uh, the smell of death is there. You know, uh, in study I discovered that at the time of Christ, many Jews had for several hundred years had the belief that when a person died, their soul hovered near their body for a period of three days, and then their soul left. Now, there's nothing in Scripture that says that. That was like a pagan superstition. But that was still kind of how they functioned, and it may have been how Martha was functioning. Two days ago, we could have done something. <laughs> now, now it's too late. Um, yet she still says, Lord, I believe... Uh, Whatever you ask of God, God will do. I see Martha, she's got one foot on this bank and one foot (laughs) on that bank. And it's hard to know which side of the stream she's going to come to. Well, look at what Jesus says to her. He has what I've always thought was a strange conversation at this point. In verse 23, he says, your brother will rise again. And Martha answers, I know that he will rise again and the resurrection at the last day. What is she talking about? End of time? All right. Uh, That's a wonderful confession, because I will tell you the Sadducees, which was most of the Sanhedrin, they didn't believe there was going to be a resurrection. So Martha's ahead of the religious leaders. (laughs) She does believe there's going to be a resurrection at the end of time. Uh, But she just can't think that there could be a resurrection now. Too late now. You know, I will tell you, I've found many times in my life, it's easier to believe with all my heart that God will at some point work everything together for good than to believe that at the point where it's not working out. Big difference. I know our church loves the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. And we have often been told the story of that hymn. The man who wrote it had lost all four of his children in a ship crossing the Atlantic. Only his wife was saved. And every time I hear that story, I'm bad for, I feel badly for him losing all his children. But I felt a little bit concerned about his wife. Why couldn't she have saved one of them? if she was saved. But you know, in studying this week, I found more details about that than I had ever heard. They're on this luxury ship. This is in the 1870s. They get rammed into by another ship, and the ship they were on goes down within 30 minutes. It's kind of like the Titanic. Now, you saw that movie. That ship was cattywampus (laughs) before it went down. Well, she had the children with her, 
on the ship and a huge wave came over the ship and three of them just completely disappeared. And she was holding a baby and another wave came and the baby was out of her arms, but she grabbed at the baby's clothing. But then another wave came and the baby came out of the clothing. And she was unconscious from that time. I don't know if she fell and hit her head, if the anxiety of that time made her faint. She, she was rescued by the ship that ran into her uh, and brought to Wales. But it was 10 days. Spafford knew about the wreck. He didn't know what had happened to his family when she sent that telegram saved alone. It just helped me to know she tried. And she couldn't. And I can see how that would be such an overwhelming thing that you would just pass out. But you know what she did when they first had that wreck and they knew that ship was going down? She gathered her children around her and she had them pray that they might be saved or that they might be made willing to die if that was God's will. Wow. But what a wonderful preparation for her children. You know, we want to save our children from bad things. But you don't have to have very old children before you realize you can't. So we need to help them be able to face the things. And she did it in that way. Well, Martha's, uh, Jesus is trying to do this for Martha. <laughs> He's trying to get Martha to the place where she's okay, whatever happens here. Uh, look at verse 25, 26. Then Jesus told her something, and this is a significant theological truth. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He didn't say, Martha... I am the resurrection and the life for me. I can lay my life down and pick my life back up, although he could. He didn't say, Martha, I know a lot of secrets about the resurrection <laughs> and life. He said, Martha, I am resurrection and life. Isn't that wonderful? If Christ live in your heart, your body may die, but your spirit will never die and there will never be an interruption between your communion with God on this earth and then communion with God there. Now it's hard for us because we see people we love die and they have left the sphere that we know anything about. And we have that grief. But for believers, that's such a wonderful thing. He's the resurrection and the life. Once you got him, you got life <laughs> for all of eternity. And he says to her, look at 25. I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. That's a believer that we see die. And whoever lives and believes in me, shall never die, that is all of us. And then look at what he says to Martha. I think he takes her by the shoulders. <laughs> Martha, do you believe this? How would you like Jesus to ask you that question? Well, look at her answer in verse 27. It's interesting. She avoids the question. But she gives a wonderful statement of faith. I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, that was prophesied to come in the world. Again, she's way ahead of the religious leaders, isn't she? Shoot, she's a little bit ahead of the disciples, too. They still are vacillating, having trouble trying to manage Jesus. Uh, and I wish there was another verse between 27 and 28. She makes that wonderful confession, and then she leaves. What does she do? She goes to do something. <laughs> to tell Mary that Jesus uh, 
has come. She calls him the teacher. She calls him the teacher. <laughs> the teacher. He has come, and more than that, he, he's calling for you. Has Jesus ever called for you? Well, we sing. Jesus is tenderly calling today. I mean, does he like, did he call you this morning? Did he say, open your eyes and let's have a few minutes together? This really spoke to my heart because I was going to get up real early this morning, but I woke up 45 minutes before the alarm went off. And the alarm was going to go off early, and this was 45 minutes before. And you know what? I just thought, Lord, you're calling me. You know what I need today. And you're calling me in time to get it done. So I'm going to get up. Now, I did think about it for five minutes. (laughs) But I did do it. Ladies, when he calls us, let's please respond. She goes to tell Mary, uh, we see that Mary quickly goes to Jesus, and he's still out of, out of town. But um, look down to verse 32. When Mary gets to Jesus, she says again, what? The very thing that, that he did. And again, we don't hear the tone, except this is Mary. And I think it was like, Lord, (laughs) if you had been here. (laughs) And that's all right. It's all right when you hurt to cry when you're talking to God. I've cried many prayers. That's one reason I don't really like prayer meeting, because I cry a lot when I pray. I feel kind of silly. But when things are on my heart and I want the Spirit of God to work, That's worthy of tears. Uh, But look at verse 32. Where was Mary when she said that? At his feet. In fact, every snapshot we have of Mary, she's at Jesus' feet. Last week, at his feet, listening to his teaching. This week, at his feet, Maybe this is where she surrenders her will to his in the death of Lazarus. And then at the banquet, we're going to look at in chapter 12. Um, Well, Jesus comes to the cemetery. We won't go over all the neat stuff that's there. In verse 39, he says, take away the stone. And that was the verse she knew that Martha said, no, (laughs) it will be a bad smell. Uh, And look at what Jesus said to her. This is very interesting. He says, Martha, didn't I tell you that if you would believe, you should see the glory of God? Now, that's one reason I thought he sent back that message. This sickness is not for death, but for the glory of God. And the other reason is he told the disciples people would believe because of this. And when they had that personal conversation and he talked to her about resurrection, he said, do you believe? So as much as she believes, (laughs) there's something else she needs to believe. You know, we say in America, seeing is believing. It's hard for me, but sometimes God wants us to believe when we can't see. I would say a lot of times. And that's a real test. Uh, Well, she doesn't answer. (laughs) I think she knew the answer. And then the Lord calls out Lazarus and he comes out of the tomb. Woo, that makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up. (laughs) I would love to have seen that as well. Several responses among the people who saw this, and I think Mary and Martha are included in this. Uh, Look at verse 45. 
What about many of the Jews who had come out of Jerusalem and seen the things which Jesus did? What did they do? They believed. Now they had seen, so they could believe. But there were others who saw the same thing, and what was their response in verse 45? All right, they ran right back to the Pharisees and said, we've got to get rid of this man. And in the last part of this chapter, they intensify their plot, and they even put out an edict. Look at the last verse in chapter 11. They put out, oh, they put out a mandate. (laughs) That's nothing new, is it? It wasn't about wearing a mask. What was it? We're going to kill him, and if anybody knows where he is, you have to come tell us, or you'll be an accessory to the crime. So that is the setting for John 12. He tells us that it was six days before the Passover, and Jesus will be dead in six days. Um, Jesus came to Bethany, and how close is that to Jerusalem? Less than two miles. So he came at personal danger to Bethany, where Lazarus, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead, and verse 2 says, they made him a supper. I bet they did. And who is serving? (laughs) Who would have (laughs) thought? And who's at the table? Lazarus is one of the ones at the table. You know, it's interesting. Every time we see this family, Lazarus never speaks. But here he is being a witness to Jesus being the resurrection and the life by his presence. And it may even cost him his life because look down at verse 10. It definitely made him a target. (laughs) didn't it? So he is there, uh, unafraid and with the Lord. Uh, Now there are parallel passages in Matthew and Mark. I believe I put those references at the top. Both of those say that this banquet was at the house of Simon the leper, not Simon the Pharisee, (laughs) but Simon the leper. So if it was at a leper's house, it must be somebody that Jesus had healed. So you got Lazarus sitting there, and he used to be dead. You got Simon sitting there. He used to be covered in leprosy. I wonder if they tried to outdo each other with their tails. You should have seen it when my scabs fell off. (laughs) Oh no, you should have seen it. (laughs) You know, I'd like that it just says, and Martha served it looks like she's cool with it. <laughs> she's not saying to Mary, what are you doing? <laughs> Why aren't you helping? Now, that's how God wants our gifts to be. Just do what you can do. Don't worry about what somebody else is doing or not doing. You just do your part. Don't criticize. Uh, I'm so glad she got there. <laughs> but look at what Mary does. Now, this is really big in verse 3. Uh, She took a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. How expensive was that spikenard? Very expensive. In fact, uh, the treasurer adds it up, and in the next few verses he says, that's a year's salary. That's how much that cost. In Bible times, people did invest in spices, like people invest in gold and silver, because that was a small, easily protected and traded item, always a market. It was like money in the bank. And she had a pound of the best spikenard, and it was pure. Tell me why she hadn't used that for her brother's funeral. 
hold that thought. All right? Normally, when you came in for a feast, a servant would wash your feet, and they would put a dab of ointment on your head. And I guess this is because they didn't have walk-in showers with tin shower heads in those days. <laughs> and it was awfully hot. <laughs> and a little ointment just helped. <laughs> uh, so Mary is putting ointment, not a dab on his head, though she may have put... She may have started pouring on his head because she would put ointment there. But she poured it out on his feet. She poured all of it out. What an extravagant gift. It would have been nice if she had just poured half of it out. That would have been amazing. And she herself demonstrated humility because she let her hair down to wipe his feet. And it's more likely that Jewish women never let their hair down in public at this time than it is that they had veiled faces because they didn't have the Arab mentality about that. They did sometimes, but the hair was always up. And it was uh, something you only let your hair down for your husband or prostitutes would wear their hair down. She did that. And what does it say about the fragrance? It the house. I bet it did. You ever opened a fragrance like that? <laughs> and it's in that room for three days. <laughs> uh, but you know why it filled the house? Because it was all on Mary's hair. You remember when we used to want sweet-smelling shampoo so our husband could smell our hair and be happy? <laughs> well, this is the ultimate here of fragrance on her hair. But she is worshiping the Lord here, and as often as the case, our worship is sometimes examined by other people. And Judas makes an appraisal of her worship. Uh, maybe he had the anti-gift of giving. Uh, he makes a very ugly comment. Who heard it? Everybody heard it. I bet everybody heard it, because I believe when she did that, it got quiet in the room. This was a remarkable thing. He said that could have been sold, and the money given to the poor, and John gives us that insight. Well, he said that because he was a thief. Greek word, kleptos where we get kleptomaniac. <laughs> Although he knew when he was stealing. <laughs> Do you know that was the only time in the Bible that Judas ever did anything wrong out in the open? When he betrayed Jesus, he did it secretly. But he just showed his heart there in front of everybody. What a waste. I hate that. I remember in the 50s when the five male missionaries were killed by the Alka Indians. Uh, even as a child, the Christian world was rocked by that. And a lot of people said, what a, what a waste. Like, God, why did you waste those? I don't know if you've ever studied about that, but a life poured out for God is not a waste. Uh, just like Mary's ointment was not a waste. But what I love is what Jesus says in verses 7 and 8. He tells us why she did it. Why did she do it? For the day of his burying. For the of his, burying his burial. And he said, the poor you always have with you. But me, you don't always have. You know, I believe Mary may have been the only follower of Jesus who ever got it that he was going to the cross. The disciples didn't get it. I wonder if Mary had bought that ointment because she realized that and she was going to give it to him before he died because she loved him. And she worshipped him. Now, Matthew and Mark add that statement. 
wherever the gospel is preached, this shall be told about her. It's interesting to me, the reward she got to be in the Bible and this to be a story known by those who know the Bible doesn't, is in the two accounts that don't tell us her name. And in the one that does tell her, tell us her name, it doesn't have that caveat. <laughs> so it must not matter whether anybody knows what you do when you serve the body of Christ or not. But it is still a fragrance. I am so happy she did that for Jesus because nobody else gave him any encouragement about his death. He told the disciples many times he was going to die. And what were they doing the night he was arrested? Arguing about who's the greatest. He said, will you please come pray with me? And what did they do? When the soldiers came, where'd they go? Nobody, nobody in Scripture ever encouraged the Lord Jesus in that which he came to do, except Mary. Ooh, I love her. <laughs> what a woman. Not just because she was mercy. Uh, I'm grateful for, there's two meanings to the Greek word mercy that's in the Roman passage for this gift. And one of them is to comfort somebody for something that's happened like you would comfort this little buddy in the hospital over his broken hip. But one of them means to encourage somebody to do something difficult that must be done. So Mary had mercy on the Lord. Well, we need both kinds of mercy. I don't know about y'all, but I need somebody to encourage me to do right <laughs> sometimes. Well, what do you think about Mary and Martha? Written for our admonition. What is our admonition? You know, I often think about the 12 years my mother was in the nursing home up here, and I had that responsibility. Those were dark years for me. And I kept praying, Lord, will you please do something? Why aren't you doing anything? Don't you love us? And it never got better. And it only got worse. And in spite of everything I did, it didn't help. I didn't understand this. I'm beginning to. Mary helped me. I really needed somebody to encourage me to think right. And I will just tell you, over those 12 years, a lot of people said, how are you doing? And I often said, I'm hanging by a thread and it's unraveling. And everybody said, oh, we'll see you later. <laughs> <laughs> and I know, what do you say? There were a couple of sisters who did what they could to help. It's very hard to go to the nursing home and take care of someone. And there were two who tried, both of them had reasons why it was very difficult for them to ever help. But it didn't help. So I wasn't looking. I was looking, I wanted to see something, and then I would believe God. Well, on the days when I worked a 12 hour shift to go feed her a meal, keep her clean and position her comfortably. And I understand that there are not many people that can do those things. I have to have a servant heart, and you kind of have to have some training <laughs> to, to feed someone who does not cooperate with you. And the text would always say, oh, she sleeps so good after you've been here. And I want to think, why can't you make her comfortable? <laughs> This is your job. <laughs> mm. oh, I'm not saying this to make you feel sorry for me, <laughs> except that I was obstinate <laughs> and unbelieving. You know, she, in those years, she never said my name. She could not talk. I couldn't tell by her face if she was glad to see me or if she even knew me. 
But she knew somebody was being nice to her. And somebody was making her comfortable. What I wanted was God to take her out of that nursing home and take her home. I mean, altogether, she had 32 years of Alzheimer's. That's like a world record. I think it's because I was so, such a doofus <laughs> part of it. No, I just didn't like it. I didn't want it to happen to her, and I wanted it fixed yesterday. Let's go back to this. Do you see how the differences between these two women complemented the ministry of Christ by what they each could do, even though they were different? Do you see how easy it is in the church to criticize somebody who doesn't see it from your perspective? You know, James and I are very different. He's a strong prophet. You may have noticed. <laughs> And so we look at a situation and we have entirely almost opposite ways of dealing with it. And so that can become a conflict on my part. He just says, oh, no, to my, my view. <laughs> and I think, but I'm right. <laughs> no, I'm different. And I view it differently. And I'm gifted differently. He doesn't like to talk about Greek words. I'm so glad we have Jaden who likes to talk about Greek words. <laughs> because I love that. <laughs> but the church is blessed by differing gifts. By men who are prophets. By men who are exhorters. By men who are givers. And I look at our church and I think, where does the money come from? <laughs> uh, I'm in a room with servers and organizers and mercy. Maybe some of you are exhorters. Maybe some of you don't like to be exhorted. <laughs> it's not just encouraging because you can encourage people in a worldly sense. Oh, you'll get over this. Just hang in there, you know, that kind of thing. It's exhorting people to do the right thing. I have exhorted some ladies to come to Bible study, and they got mad at me. They're not here, so it's none of you. <laughs> uh, and really, I didn't want them to come hear me. But I did know what was going on in their life and how this would help them so much. Now, instead of me sitting down with you and saying, Sister, I know what you need. <laughs> Let's all look at this together and have the benefit of the insights from each of you. But let's just be women who manifest our gifts without criticizing another, another perspective. And then how we will all be built up. Well, this has been long. I apologize. But it was just so good. <laughs> well, we'll meet in two weeks. And... James asked me yest yesterday what I would be talking about, but I couldn't tell him because I don't know. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you for coming. <laughs>